Hey everyone, welcome to the Pot Awareness Podcast and thanks for joining me. This podcast is specifically for about educating and raising awareness for animals and rescues and organizations across the United States and world. It really goes a long way towards this mission when our listeners rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and all of our other podcast platforms. Also, be sure to check us out on our official website at pawawareness.org and on social media at TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram at pawawareness underscore podcast. You can check us out for all of our latest bits and clips of our podcast, as well as pet of the week and pet of the month. If you're listening and involved with an animal rescue organization or have a story of your own that you want to share, reach out to us at info at pawawareness.org and we can get you on the podcast. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoy this episode. Hey everyone, welcome to today's episode of the Paw Awareness Podcast. Today I'm sitting down with Michelle Graper, the Executive Director of Tales Humane Society. Um, I wanna thank you so much for coming on and uh, getting to speak with us. Um, so I'm just gonna pass it over to you. Go ahead and introduce yourself and more about the organization. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate you having us here today. So yeah, I'm Michelle Graper. I'm the Executive Director at Tales Humane Society. We're located in DeKalb, Illinois, which is about 60 miles west of Chicago. So we are sort of still technically Chicago suburbs. We still get all the Chicago stuff. And um, so it's a interesting mix of we're actually fairly rural, but um, also suburban and, and people come from all over. So We've been an animal shelter for about 20 years now, an organization for 20 years. Um, our building is was was built about 16 years ago, but um, we care for uh, about 3,400 dogs, cats, puppies, and kittens and little critters every year. And little critters for us are um, rabbits and gerbils and birds and sugar gliders and rats and all the small and furry. If you're small and furry and homeless, you can come to Tails and we'll find you a new home. Um, we don't do reptiles or farm animals. We just don't have the space or expertise. Um, although I say small and furry, but we have a St. Bernard right now and he is very furry and not at all small. So I guess that's, if you, if you can live in a home and you have fur, you can come to Tails. Um, we have, um, our mission is is basically finding homeless pets homes again. Um, we have a, a handful of supporting services as well. So we have an affordable spay neuter clinic. In the state of Illinois, it is um, state law that all pets, dogs and cats are spayed and neutered prior to adoption. We were doing that before that was state law. Um, it is also open to the public. So if you have a dog or cat, um, that is not fixed yet, you can make an appointment with us. And we um, try to have competitive rates. Um, I, I don't like to say low cost. I like to say affordable because we still have um, a pretty, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's great quality care. Um, and it is, but it is high volume. So our vets average about 50 animals a day, which is kind of cool. So um, we also have a dog training program. So if you adopt a dog or a puppy from Tails, you get a coupon to come to our dog training class. And that's also open to the public as well. So kind of high level of who we are and what we do. That's really cool. And I like to ask the question too. I feel like geographically every, like every area is kind of like battling mm -hmm. their own thing or like there's different stuff going on. I'm actually from like the Springfield, Illinois area. Okay. That's yeah. like where I'm from, despite yep. being out here in California. Yep. Um, but what's that? I moved about five years ago. What's that kind of like? And how do you get the dogs into your facility? Like, how do you find the dogs? Yep. That's a great question. So we have a number of intake sources. So um, for cats and kittens, most of them are local for us. So we'll take in over 700 kittens this summer. Kitten season is is starting. It's not in quite full swing, but it is starting. Um, and um, then we also have owner surrender animals. So if a family member can't keep their pet anymore for whatever reason, that's why we're here. I like that to be a great resource, that we're a great resource for our community as well and just kind of Chicagoland area. Um, you know, life changes and um, just sometimes things happen and you can't keep your pet and that's okay. And that's what we're here for. We also um, partner with our very local animal, uh, DeKalb County Animal Control. And we take in the dogs. Cats um, are not considered strays in our county. So um, we, that's, we take them in just as strays into the shelter. And then we also partner, we are a great transfer partner for um, our open admission shelter partners, your traditional animal controls and, and animal services. So um, not only local 
Um, we go to Chicago and um, I could list a number of counties that anybody else who isn't local to us wouldn't know what they were. But, um, you know, if they're overcrowded and at risk of euthanasia, um, we'll, we go in there and, and we'll pull those animals. And then primarily our puppies come from down south. So in the northern part of Illinois, we've spayed and neutered our way for the most part out of a puppy problem, which is great. Um, that said, there are other parts of the country that are just aren't there yet or their communities don't support that. And, you know, dogs primarily maybe aren't considered a family member. Um, and so they have some fairly overcrowded shelters in the South and we partner with them. We, um, for the most part, again, puppies come from the South. They come with their moms for the most part. Um, we do transfer in some adult male dogs, um, but we, we try hard to make sure that those kennel, that kennel space um, in our shelter is, is uh, for our local dogs. So, um, so yeah, so those are our main intake sources. And I'll also make another mention, something that's important to us too, that you'll notice that I use the words um, open admission shelter for our shelter partners. We don't use the words like kill and no kill shelter at Tails. We find that to be fairly divisive and kind of hurtful to those who work in your kill shelters. That's not a cool term. And those folks working there, kind of like you and me and your best friend and your sister and your brother and your mom, and they work really hard in communities that may not support spay neuter yet. Um, they don't want to adopt or euthanize adoptable animals. So that's where shelter partners like Tails and a number of other shelter partners um, in Northern parts of, this, of the country um, will partner with them. So we consider ourselves what we call a limited admission or managed admission shelter because we manage our admission. We don't euthanize for space or time. Um, we have, um, if, if you, the, there, there's an arbitrary number um, out there for, for, you know, no kill shelters and we do fall well within that range. Um, and that's also why we partner with what we call our open admission shelters. And those are the ones who legally obligated or have chosen as their mission to take in all animals. And sometimes when they're overcrowded, they have to make really hard decisions. So that's why we're there. Yeah, you made a really good point there where it's the definition, like just the, it's not like these kill shelters want to put down the animals. It's not like, and I guess, can you go into that a little bit more on terms of like, just for someone listening who maybe doesn't understand the difference there. So what, what exactly is happening in the kill shelters, right? Like what, yeah. what makes it a kill shelter? What doesn't make, you know, what's a non kill shelter like in terms of that terminology? So for the, the folks who we all are looking for the same mission, I'll put that out there to you, because I, I will say that I'm probably going down a path that where some people are watching this and going, oh, my God, you're one of those people who don't use those terms. And yeah, yeah, I am. And that's OK. Um, so the, the definition of a no kill shelter was determined to be if you euthanize less than 10 percent of your animals a year. And um, so that is somewhat of an arbitrary number. And the, the, the sort of the trouble you can get into with that is there are shelters. Um, and again, they're just in communities or just, you know, in areas of where their community just isn't there yet, or for whatever reason, their shelter just isn't there yet with spay neuter and adoptability. And there's a lot of factors that go into that. There are sometimes a lot of out of their control. Um, so they might euthanize more than 10% of their animals. And there are shelters and I mean, it's not hard to find stories online of where sometimes they won't make euthanasia decisions um, for medical or behavior reasons. And especially the medical ones are, are, are pretty awful when they're not euthanizing an animal that needs to be euthanized because of some arbitrary number. And that's where I think the shelters like mine where we we try hard not to get into the to the nitty gritty of the kill and no kill um, for those reasons too. So we follow sort of there's a socially conscious sheltering model out there, um, and it's just basically follow, do good things for the animals in your care. You know, um, if if they're adoptable, do what you uh, adopt them out, and if they're not, it's okay to let them go. It's also not okay to transfer, um, a, you know, primarily dogs, but dogs who might have seriously harmed or, or killed a person in the past. And you don't want to euthanize that dog. So you transfer out to another shelter. That's not okay either. You know, so that's where we're going with it is just make the right decisions for the animals in your care. Um, and, and be kind and partners with your other shelters who might not be 
as in a good spot as you are. I think that's great. That's great advice. And you even kind of touched on a little bit before that, how maybe some communities don't really see dogs as dogs, but, or, or animals, they just kind of look at them as, as things. And um, for me, that's really hard to comprehend, but it wasn't until I talked with a lady who rescues dogs out of Puerto Rico. And then it's like, and then found out that this is happening in the States where it's like, you know, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that. And it sounds like the Northern Illinois community is pretty good. Uh, like, it seems like it's, you know, which is awesome because now you guys can now rescue some of these dogs and from some of these other locations. And I'm curious to know what's the, uh, like, what's the relationships look like? Like, how do you build relationships with a shelter that's not in your area? Like, how does that work? So, you know, for us, we've had such long standing relationships with some of our partners that it's hard for me to even, you know, think of how, how we make new ones. And I will say at this point, um, thankfully tails has a really good reputation that we have shelters referring other shelters to us as a potential transfer partner. So for, for us, we, we, we don't really have to try very hard to find them. And sometimes we, we can't, and we can't take every dog or cat or ferret or rabbit, um, that's in need and that's hard sometimes, but, um, you know, if you are what's called, uh, you know, there's, there's transfer shelters and, and recipient shelters and intake shelters. There's so many message boards out there. And honestly, like even the ASPCA has, has a transfer program. There's, um, message boards out there. So, um, the SAWA has a, has a good message board out there. So it's just a matter of finding, um, a shelter you feel comfortable with. And for us, we have to be partners on both sides. So if, and we have partnered with maybe a new shelter in the past or a rescue and they did not hold up their end of the bargain. And if they're transferring animals that we didn't agree to, or um, they are using a black Sharpie to color in um, hair loss on a dog, that's a problem. That's not okay. Um, if we say we, you know, we, we actually take a lot of, it, it happened. I'm not, <laughs> not making that, that happen. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> um, if, you know, if we say we can take heartworm positive dogs and, and we do, we, we treat a lot of heartworm positive dogs. Um, and you tell us that fluffy is not heartworm positive and you then send fluffy to us with paperwork that says you knew heart fluffy was our, those are the types of things. So just be a good partner on both sides. You know, for us, we need to make sure we are communicating, um, how many dogs we can take and what size is. And we're working with our foster homes to do that. Um, and then we can't show up to them and say, Oh my gosh, well, we changed our mind and we can't take them. So, and then on the transfer side, just make sure you're just really transparent about the dogs and the temperaments. And you know, that that's going to go a long way to having a lasting relationship. That's a really good point. Yeah. Just, just transparency and communication and honesty. It sounds like common sense, but you know, it's still something I'm working on over here. So it's like, sometimes it's, that's awesome that you guys are, that you guys are doing that. And I wanted to ask you too, we kind of touched on this before the call is just like, how big is your team? Like how many people, <laughs> how big or how small is your team, I guess? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, I love to talk about our team. So we have 25 employees. So um, eight of them are full time and everybody else is part time, a variety of roles. So we have animal care and front desk and um, our dog trainer and um, marketing person and our volunteer manager and our events manager. Um, so uh, again, a wide variety of roles. <clears throat> and what I'm really proud of with our, our team is that we have some folks who have been around for 15 years. So we have a couple managers who have been there for 15. I think I'm next at about coming up on eight. We have a handful of other managers that are five, six, seven. We have animal care techs who've been there for two and three years. Um, and a number of other managers who are coming up on four or five. Um, our dog trainer has been there for a number of years, and I'm very proud of that. It's not to say that we're not perfect. Um, or perfect because we are we're not. Um, but I and we also we have turnover like everybody else does for a variety of reasons. But I um, I 
I come from a business background and A, we need to run our shelter like a business. I have to make sure that we can pay our bills and um, help the animals, as many animals as we can on the financial side. And also though, that we set a really good example as teammates. And um, you rarely hear me call our staff staff because they're teammates. I'm much better of the coach and team aspect. And I think that that um, we have fun at work. You know, we have, it's sometimes we have some really hard days. Sometimes there's really sad days. Um, sometimes everybody has COVID and we are trying just to figure out the bare minimum just to get the animals cared for and, and, and adopted. But, um, I am very proud of the longevity of our team. Um, and some of them again, have been around for even longer than I've been there. And I think that's pretty cool. That's so cool. And you mentioned too, like, there's like, you know, different, different people doing different things and, and you have a, a dog training program. Can you talk more about that? And then is there any other program that you have um, outside of that? Or what's that like? So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the main animal facing one. So not only our dog trainer um, teaches classes, we have a number of classes a week for the public. Um, and she also, we do play groups. So we're a big fan of play groups. We're a big fan of um, enrichment in the shelter. Um, so we do play groups a few times a week. She actually helps does some of our assessments. Um, we do fairly formal, informal assessments. Um, we don't assess every single dog um, if they come from an owner surrender and they're up to date on everything and we have their information. We're going to fast track them for adoption because we trust, you know, the people telling us the information as long as we feel like we can trust the people giving us the information. Um, so, um, yeah, so we have a variety of, of dog training, um, puppy class, which is fun. And then we have an adolescent class and then a couple of adults, um, kind of one and two classes as well. Our other program, again, more of like our spay neuter program. So we have a clinic, um, we do spay neuter two days a week, um, those days are full days, again, with 50 or about 50 surgeries a day. Um, there's a balance of public surgeries as well as you know, um, shelter surgeries. Our vets, um, one of our vets is also kind of a dental expert. So just yesterday we had a dental day. Um, she does that one or two to a couple of days a month. Um, they do our rounds for us. So whichever day our vet is in, they'll come over and do rounds in the shelter as well. Um, they are pretty good at what we call our oddities. So we can, um, you know, if you've worked in animal welfare at all, you know, we get the weirdest thing sometimes from a medical standpoint. I mean, some of it's pretty cut and dry, but there's always a skin something or somebody's got an eye issue, unfortunately, or, um, there's not a lot we don't do medically, quite frankly. And <clears throat> I guess I'm kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, overshooting into, um, we do have a medical fund. And there's not a ton we don't do for our medical, kind of pretty do pretty extraordinary medical care. Um, that There's not a lot we don't treat. Um, we go through phases. I don't know if anybody else watching this will nod their head when we just, we'll have, you know, eye issues for a month and a half. And, oh my God, what's going on? And I have orthopedic issues for six months. And, um, you know, we, we just kind of, just, again, just kind of not a lot we don't treat on the medical side either, which is... Um, I think people know us for that as well. And sometimes we do get some phone calls because they know that they could trust us with the animals um, if they got a medical thing going on. No, that's really amazing. And I think I wanted to ask you too, just to specify, right? So your dog training program, it sounds like it's more for like people once they, once they get a dog. So, yeah. so that's different than like, taking a dog that might have like social behavioral issues yeah. or something that's different, right? It is. So we do, um, our dog trainer actually, she has her own business as well. So we refer, um, if there is a dog, a non shelter dog or a shelter, that's not a, a dog. That's not a shelter resident. How about that? A current shelter resident, whether they were adopted from us or not, if somebody calls a shelter and it's something kind of just out of what we can really do just in regular classes, um, we know that our dog trainer, Crystal, she can work with them, um, through her own company. And we're completely fine with that just because unfortunately she just, we just, can't have her full time and do all of the things yet. So, um, but we do, we do are able to refer to those resources for somebody who needs help for a non shelter resident dog. Awesome. Okay. And then, um, I mean, what would you say, like, you know, having to been in the industry for a while and like having a whole team, if someone's wanting to get into this field, like more than just a volunteer, mm -hmm. 
what would you advise them or what would you tell them? I think it depends on where where they want to go within animal welfare. Do they want to run a shelter? Do they want to do volunteer management? Do they want to be the shelter manager of where it's more hands-on animal care? Do they want to do development and they want to do fundraising and raise money for the shelter? So I think that depends. If anybody can do an internship, and we're actually interviewing this week for our summer intern, our interns are primarily for events and marketing. Um, but I am a huge fan of internships or job shadows. Um, come in, make a phone call. <clears throat> we do. So we have um, Northern Illinois University is in our town. So um, we get phone calls and emails all the time asking for either school projects um, or, or different things. But I've done multiple interviews or just even had somebody come in. It's not exciting to watch my job. <laughs> it's a lot of emails and phone calls, but, um, but if somebody wants to, you know, see what it's like to do animal care one day, you know, come on in. And we actually love it. I think a good conduit or a good path is start as a volunteer because you get to see it all. You kind of get to do it all for free to start off with, but we have hired multiple volunteers in a variety of roles. So actually a volunteer is a great place to start if you're looking to do something in animal welfare and also find one that's a good fit for you. Kind of like I was saying before about even that terminology, there are shelters who have, we use different terminology or they have different philosophies. There's there are a lot of animal welfare agencies out there. So if ours isn't a great fit for you for whatever reason, I'm quite sure there's another one somewhat nearby where it, they might be a better fit for you for whatever reason. That's a great advice. Yeah, like find one that is a good fit for you. Volunteer first. I think it's like there's mm -hmm. no really risk there other than just, you know, your time. Mm -hmm. Like just yeah. see and just that's awesome. Um, and what... What are some big plans or things that you're excited about in the works uh, for the, the, you know, your organization and just like yeah. maybe some individuals on your team? What's that like? Yeah, so that's a great question, too. So, you know, so many people ask that and it's not that we don't have super, super grand plans. Like our main one is that we have outgrown our building <clears throat> and I think most places would say that the minute their place is built, they've outgrown their building. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so we are very seriously beginning to, to talk about um, an adoption center. So of having our current shelter be an intake facility and having an adoption center somewhere nearby. So um, that's not going to happen tomorrow, but it is something that we're excited to start talking about. Um, internally, I think that I know we're all just tired of talking about COVID and all of the things that changed in the last couple of years, but I think we kind of did a really good job of, of that when you use all the business bingo terms of pivoting. And um, so, but we, for our, for our events, we, um, we've had a couple of different events because we didn't do in person and we found that actually kind of our traditional um, gala dinner auction it was dying. So we're actually, we've done a few different things um, from an event standpoint that have been, we did a um, what we called our puppy pooper bowl earlier. So it was basically squares on the floor of almost like uh, football squares um, pool. And we put a bunch of puppies into a pen <laughs> and people bought squares. And the first person that the square got pooped on. They won money from us. <laughs> so like, That's it was super fun. It was, it's, 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 yeah. it was super fun. Um, it was great. It actually, we thought it'd be over in three or four minutes. It took that puppy. I think it was like 30 minutes. It was a long time. I felt so sorry for our fence person. She had to talk about filling time. She had to fill a lot of time. Um, <clears throat> so, but little things like that. So, um, we're doing an online auction instead of having an in-person auction. Um, another, if anybody's on here and interested in taking ideas, please feel free to contact us. We actually took, um, borrowed the Puppy Pooper Bowl from, I think it was Great Plains SBCA, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I borrowed another fundraiser idea that's been just wonderful for us. We do a lotto tree now. So a friend of mine works for um, a domestic violence shelter and their auction, they did um, this lotto tree. So we borrowed that. And basically our board, it's funded by, for us, it's our board donates $20 per board member. We go out and buy all of these instant, different denominations of instant lotto tickets. And it comes from a tree because you can make it look like a tree, we basically just make it, put it on, take a picture of it. Um, and then for 
entry fee of $10. Um, you get an, an, an unlimited entries. It's all online. And then we pick one and somebody wins all those lotto tickets. Um, and um, that went from, I think it was a $1,700 to a $4,000 to a $7,000 fundraiser for us. So please take, steal, borrow that idea too. So those are, again, maybe not super grand plans, but those are some of the things that, that have worked for us and that we're continuing to work on this year, um, just from a fundraising standpoint. I think that's great too. Like have like an open source, uh, like just, you know, Hey, here's what we're doing because at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's just helping everybody yeah. out. Like that's Let's work smarter, not harder, work together. We're all in this just to help the animals. Yeah. Like it's not, you know, everybody if it nice saves more dogs and cats <laughs> exactly, and whatever, Chris. like then it's, that's what it's all about. So yeah, no, that's amazing. And where can people find you guys and follow along and yep. connect with? So um, we have a variety of social media. So um, actually Facebook for us is still kind of our number one. We do All multiple right. posts a day. We have share adoptable animals. Um, we do a funny post a day, which sometimes depending on the adoptable animal, we post the funny post is will go viral almost as well. Um, you found us, I think, on the TikToker, as I call it, because I'm not super social media savvy, but we've got some great people on the team who are. So we had a, a post that went viral, I think, six weeks ago or so. That that was just pretty amazing. Um, and we're also on Instagram. And then our website is taleshumanesociety.org. You can see all of our adoptable pets. It's updated in real time. It's connected to our database. Um, so yeah, you can kind of find us anywhere. And my contact information is on our website. Um, again, anybody who's watching this and have questions about what we do or any of our events, I'm um, just happy to talk with anybody. I think anything we can do to work together is just the best thing ever. That's so awesome. And wherever you're listening at, the, all of that will be down in the description below. And I just want to thank you so much for coming on and Thanks, uh, sharing a little bit about your organization, some things that you guys are doing. And, and uh, once again, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Chris. Have a good day. You too.